Thank you. Um, well, my film was called Ghosted and I'm the writer, director, producer, along with the other producers. And uh, it's about a woman with a, a lot of baggage who falls in love with a man haunted by his past. And that's literally, she literally carries around a lot of baggage and he's literally followed by the ghost of his ex. It's told in kind of a fairy tale way. way. So uh, we're really excited. This is our actual, this is our in-person premiere because of the pandemic today. So Awesome. So tell me how you came about the story because it could happen in real life because, you know, we do find people with a lot of baggage, men or women. And yeah. then, you know, people who are widowed, you know, are haunted by mm -hmm. their exes sometimes. So where did the yeah. inspiration for the story come from? Well, um, I felt I did fall in love with a widower. I, I, you know, we're still great friends. And, and but I, I felt that there wasn't really room for me, you know, in, in the relationship. And, um, you know, it's you know, I've, I'm not, I'm not knocking grief for the pe period of time that people need to grieve. That is, that is, you know, but the feeling, my experience, the feeling was there wasn't a lot of room for me, even though there was a lot of love between us. And, and then I thought, well, I can't just project this all onto the other person. I have to think, you know, what am I bringing to this relationship? And then I thought, oh, I'm bringing a lot of baggage. <laughs> and so I thought, well, let, let me tell the story. You know, I like, like mixed signals and ghosts. I like telling stories with two flawed people, you know, like it's never just one. I, I never think things are one person's fault. Most of the time, it's not one person's fault. So, so it's like, how, how are you affecting it? And, and what's getting in the way of you getting the things that you want or the love that you want and being present, you know, in life. So that, that's where the inspiration come from. Well, oftentimes my, my shorts are lessons to myself. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. You know, your, your shorts really mirror everyday life because no one's perfect. Let's be honest. And you always have flawed people in your film i mean mm -hmm. you know like i said at the beginning of this interview this story can be told thousands of times a day around this world so tell me how therapeutic was this for you to make this film because you were in a relationship as you said and you do find this your films to be therapy for yourself so tell me a little bit about that process um yeah thank you that's a great question i i um i think i started thinking it was going to be one thing you know, and, and the, 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 you know, and through writing it, directing it, and then, and then, you know, they say you make th three movies, one when you write, one when you shoot, one when you edit, and, and it just evolved, and my own understanding of it evolved as I went, you know, and, and a lot of that was like, don't blame anyone, you know, like, he was doing the best that he could with, you know, where he's at, and, and people are at different spaces in their journey, you know, and they're never, you're never on the, you're never on the exact same page Everybody has different experiences and different point, you know, points of view. So, so um, I tried to turn it on myself and like, how can I take the love that I found in that, that I found in me in this and put it towards myself and put it towards my future, whatever that might be. And that, that doesn't involve carrying around a lot of baggage. You know, you don't have to carry around things from your past, whether it's like hurt from a past relationship, you know, or, or childhood trauma, or whatever you might go have gone through that you, you might be unnecessarily carrying around. Um, like, I don't want to give away the whole movie, hopefully people will see it. But, but, you know, there's some shedding of baggage for one of the characters. And, and um, that's, I remember the moment that I felt that personally, it was probably not, it was proud right around this time of, of about to shoot the film pretty much. And I thought, I don't have to carry this stuff around anymore. And just this weight, this you know, weight lifted. And, and you know, if, if you're giving things real estate in your brain that don't need that, and you and then you free that up, what kind of amazing things can you do when you when you have that back, you know, so, um, so just forgiving people, um, understanding and having compassion for people being in different uh, places. And and the strangest thing when I was in the edit, I thought the movie was all about grief, you know, and about, um, like I said, trauma and, and shedding things you don't need. And then when we were in the edit, I was watching it, our final sound mix, and I thought, this is a movie about addiction. That's, that's, I, and I thought, wow, he, he's a kind of, a, you know, addicted to, it's like, what are the things we're addicted to that keep us from being present, you know? And that was a whole new layer that I didn't even see actually until the sound mix. So. That was awesome. So your characters are great. The story is awesome. Tell us about your sets, because your sets are, are, are what make it as well. And to me, you don't cut any cost on it. I really love the opening scene where they're going up the stairs. Beautiful shot. So tell me about the sets in your filming locations. Hey, thank you. Um, well, I was kind of a stickler. I drove everybody a little bit crazy because I was like, it has to be, the sets have to be great. It has to be magical. You know, it has to feel like this timeless play, you know, it's, you know, feel and look, look and feel to it. So um, 
I had an intern at the time. Her name is Morgan. She's really amazing. And um, I was like, just like make a book of like all the places you can find, you know? And she must have found like, I mean, dozens, if not maybe a hundred places, you know? And I was- Interns and was are only- the best. Interns are the best. <laughs> I love her. I owe her forever. Um, she's gone on to do amazing things. Um, and, and there was only one, actually, there was only one I kind of liked. We tried to get that one. And they said, oh, you're, you, you can't have more than 10 people. You can't shoot here, you know? And then they said, but, and I was like, oh, please, we really love it. And they said, you seem nice. We do have another location that we're, it's not on, air, you know, peer space or whatever. We can, we can show you that. And I was like, please, because I love your aesthetic. And it was this house, you know? So it, it, took, it took all Morgan doing all of that and then me begging them for a place we didn't get to find a place that was even better. And that house that we shot in, it's so cute. You know, it's just so, it, a lot of that was, a lot of the production design was kind of, Fernando, Fernando Marroquin, our production designer, did amazing things, but he did have an amazing house to work with as well, you know. And they were selling that the next week after our shoot. So it was just such a like, you know, like no, re, we couldn't do any reshoots because it's like, okay, it's, it's gone. The house is gone. But um, I just really, really love that house. And, and with the steps, um, I looked at a lot of steps and those were the only ones that felt, kind of magical I'd seen them in other movies you know and I was and, and um, the ice cream shop a friend of mine Jose in in, a, in LA he's an architect and I said I love your aesthetic have you ever worked at an ice cream shop have you ever like designed an ice cream shop and he's like there's one in Silver Lake I'll put in a good word you can see if you can and luckily they opened it up to us so we had to you know trade faith we had to barter we didn't have a lot of money so we had to like barter with the ice cream shop <laughs> it's awesome but, you know the, like I said this the, the, the opening scene with the steps, I mean, was just so beautiful because you had that sun, that sun was just right. The characters were in the right place. I mean, you just did a wonderful job. And of course, the rest of the, your, your sets are, are wonderful as well. But that's what really got me into it. You know, I follow you on the gram. You, you, you're having fun at the film festival. This week uh, marks off Cinema Week. So tell us how important to you as a filmmaker to be back in action, to be back at the film festival Virtual fests are great. They were great yeah. to um, bring films to to the audiences and to raise money for a lot of these film festivals. But as a filmmaker, you guys are having fun on the gram. Tell us how important it is to have film festivals back in person and film festivals in general. Uh, um, oh, it's so important. I mean, we make movies for audiences. You know, we don't just make them to just sit alone and be like, "Yay!" Pat ourselves on the back. You know, the whole thing is. You know, I love screening. You know, Women Texas Film Festival before and now here just to, to, to have the discussions afterwards. How did you interpret the film? What, what, what's your experience that's like this? You know, we don't get to have those as much when it's virtual. And, and um, we are so excited. Like we were getting ready yesterday and we're like, what's it like to wear makeup? You know, like we haven't worn, you know, we're like, oh, we get to dress up and go somewhere. It's been like a year, you know? So, um, and even the festival theme, A New Hope, it's, it has such a, a personal meaning to me because I've been doing a lot of writing in this year while we were kind of like waiting out the pandemic. And I'm, I'm ready to shoot a lot of the things I've been writing and I want to be back out there and work with some of the same people and celebrate with fellow filmmakers and meet people. I met people at the party last night, just really wonderful filmmakers, you know? And so I do feel like that's a really uh, great theme, a new hope. That's what it feels like. It feels like we're ready. We're, we're excited to get back out there and and film is a communication, you know, and, and it's hard to communicate when you can't see or talk to anybody, you know, it's almost impossible. So perfectly said perfectly said you know speaking of community you know i was doing research for this interview and you had a kickstarter that you did for this film and you had prizes and incentives so tell us a bit about that that you know community because you've been very successful in doing kickstarters it seems like you understand that formula and you know how to hook the investor in and you know and of course handsomely reward them so tell me a little bit about that the, this this was the first time um, that I that I did a Kickstarter and I did it because it originally I did it because I didn't want to hold back. I was like, I want these sets, you know, I want, you know, Xander Estin, our costume designer, is coming tonight and I wanted costumes. I, went, I was like, this is a fairy fairy tale, a storybook thing. We need we need money to do that. We, I can't just fund it myself, you know, this time and things like that. So um, and, and what I found doing the Kickstarter was, I mean, this is kind of a backwards way to answer your question, but um, I found an unexpected thing where I felt like there was such a we every step of the way with making the film and as people people you know I'd tear up when we'd get a donation to be like oh so and so from my childhood donated or 
so-and-so from this film we did two years ago or my aunt or whoever, you know, like, and, and so then I felt that I had all of their support and all of their kindness and, you know, it's a lot easier to go out there and lead when it's we, you know, it's like you're doing, you're fighting the, you're going through the obstacles for, for, you know, just I is kind of small, you know, so, so, um, and I, I, plus, grew, uh, I played sports growing up, so I'm, I'm a team player, like this, oh, I got to lead the team, you know, so I think engaging with them along the way and having like different rewards at every level, but I never felt that, I think authenticity is really important, I, I never felt that we were trying to like hook, hook somebody, it always felt like I want to share these things, you know, I, I want to, um, and I, I think people really responded to that. You know, we did a lot of lives along the way, me and the cast and got people excited. And, and I've tried to like thank people on social media personally and, and, you know, all kinds of things like that. So I think my, Maya Angelou had a quote about calling on those people when you go out there, you know, and, and that's, that's what the Kickstarter did for me. You know? I mean, you guys have been very smart about social media. You guys are very active. You're, you know, you're, you're shouting people out, you know, you're thanking yeah. them for, you know, handing over their hard-earned money, especially during a pandemic, that's got to be hard. And be hard. Yeah. you guys are really doing it very well. Um, what team, what sports did you play when you were younger? Um, I played, oh my gosh, you ready? Okay, I played uh, softball for nine, for nine years, basketball for three years. Um, I ran track, but I wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> I'm, um, and then volleyball. I lived in Russia for a year and I played ice hockey. Really? Uh, yes. <laughs> Tell me about that. That is interesting. Ice hockey in Russia. What propelled Tracy to go to Russia to play a women's ice hockey? My, my it was it was a, a, a co-ed team. My my stepdad worked there. We, you know, I'm from Texas, and and he was in oil, so we moved there for a year. And I was like, and I did. They didn't have a softball team. And I was like, oh, what am I gonna do? And and uh, that's when I started volleyball. But uh, but I needed. I was like, when am I going to get a chance to play ice hockey again? And like, actually on the ice outside, like, this is amazing. So um, it was intense. Like I was tougher than I thought. Like, have you, ever, you want to see how tough you are, play ice hockey, you know, like, <laughs> but I loved, I loved it. And um, I know you might've noticed there's like, um, there's a theme in my work usually about underdogs or, right. or fish out, fish out of water or late coming of age stories and stuff. And that year in Russia, I was 14 and it gave me so much insight into my storytelling at a young age where it was like I didn't speak the language you know I I had to learn and struggle to get by but but there was such a beauty in everything I was seeing and the people I was meeting and you know the experience you know everybody should I think everybody should live abroad if they can for a little while you know um and I took that back with me and I, I just I think I'll never forget it you know the reason I asked this and we're gonna this is your last question I'm gonna go Patrick because Patrick is back with us you know, playing these team sports, how did that experience help you become a filmmaker, help you become a director and a producer? Um, I, gosh, it helps so much, especially, I think, for women. I think women, um, women working with other women, we're not competing, you know, we're on the same team, you know, and, and uh, for me having that, I never saw women as, as competition. I always said, oh, we're, we're working towards the same goal, you know, we, whether, whether even if we're on different films you know a fellow when a fellow director wins an award I'm like I feel like I won a fellow female director won I feel like I won so so I think that helped you know because that can take up a lot of space we're indoctrinated to kind of like think that way and it's just not true you know and um and the other thing is leading um you know when your team is like supporting when you're down you know like there's so many obstacles and you have people have bad days on a set or every step of the way is hard, you know, making it, an especially an indie film. And so just being able to be like, okay, we got this, you know, those, those speeches that you make, you know, in the, in the, in the locker room that you say, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to do this. Those are really important when the, when the chips are down and you're against all odds. You know? Awesome. Patrick, we have you back. So introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your film. Hi, my name is uh, Patrick Hogan. I'm the writer director of the film Killing Time. Uh, it's a kind of sci-fi horror thriller about a woman who goes out on a jog in the woods behind her remote home and attracts the attention of a mysterious figure, clad on Black, who follows her back to her remote home and slips inside and lies in wait for her. And eventually, uh, this woman is going to have to confront decisions she made in the past if she wants to uh, protect and save her family with some twists and turns that you might not expect along the way. 
so such a wonderful film as well. Um, tell us, where did the inspiration for the story come from? Well, I uh, a couple of years ago, I, uh, or, or well, it feels like a couple of years ago, I guess it was only a, a year and a half ago, uh, I read an article in a magazine and I, I can't talk about what the article was talking about because that will ruin the surprise. Of course. But it, it spurred an idea that I had. Uh, and I, I wrote a short film on that idea right up, right after I read the article. And, and then during the pandemic, um, you know, I was sitting around at home not doing anything and, and my actor friends were not doing anything. And I thought, why don't we make this, see if we can figure out a way to make a film during the pandemic following all the rules and protocols because these actors are SAG actors and we got to be safe. And that particular film, a short film, I was like, you know what, I can reconfigure this in a way that will work the original script wasn't pandemic safe, but I could maybe act as a challenge. Let's see if I could do it. And let's see if we can film it in one weekend up at Big Bear. Um, and we did. And that's how it came to be. It, I mean, it was, it, I wrote the script. I wrote the new version in June. We filmed it in October. The film was done in February. So it was a very quick process. Awesome. So you're at the Big Bear Film Festival right now. You filmed it in Big Bear. Tell us a little bit about filming in Big Bear. Why filmmakers should come up and film in the Big Bear area. Well, I mean, um, first off, it's, you know, I always say, especially on, on lower budget projects, like every short film ever made, <laughs> production value is something that that often gets overlooked. Production design and the value you get from it, I should say, um, is, is something that oftentimes is like, you know, typically the beginner filmmaker films their short film in their, you know, living room, which is a very comfortable and nice living room, but it is not a very cinematic uh, living room. So getting cinematic uh, uh, production design is really important in a short film. Uh, the location can tell you so much in a short film that you don't have to set up with exposition and dialogue and long scenes because you don't have that time. You need to like just show a visual and set up the audience of what they're getting. And being here in Big Bear gives you a lot of different looks that you can't get in the city. Um, the remote feeling of my film was very important to it, to feel that she's all alone out there in the woods and all alone in that house. And there are no other houses nearby and no one's going to come, you know, to their rescue. Um, and that was something that we were able to get up here uh, in Big Bear. And there's just, you know, there's a great community. There's a lot of very talented people who live up here uh, already. You know, uh, two of the three actors in the film are Big Bear residents. Um, uh, the whole crew outside of uh, the DP, myself and our COVID compliance officer slash producer, everybody else was uh, based here in Big Bear. So there are a lot of talented people up here as well. So you get you get that production value and you get you know access to a lot of uh, very talented people up here. I mean, your production value was just off the charts. I mean, it was beautifully done, especially your, your outdoor shots. I mean, it was just wonderfully done. I, I hate that we're short from time, but I wanna ask you, what did you learn about yourself professionally and personally while making this film? Because I believe that Every time we do a film, we learn about ourselves and we, you know, advance in life. So what did you learn about yourself? Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> Thanks. The film was made so quick. I don't know what I learned. Let me think. You know, I think part of it is is passion is contagious. And and we pushed two days. It was two hard days. I'm not gonna lie. Those were two hard days to get this film made especially having to follow certain protocols that slowed us down, you know, that didn't exist previously. And I think what I learned was um, passion is, is infectious. And I was very passionate about making this because I loved the concept and I loved the idea of getting together and doing this during this kind of very dark, isolated time. We were able to get a group of people together and it was a very small group, but um, we all worked towards this common goal and, and made this film you know, on, you know, like he's, I, I, I'm glad that you talked about how great it looks because, you know, we did this on, you know, we didn't even have a shoestring budget. There was just an empty islet where a shoestring should go for the budget for this film. But you can't tell because all no. of these great people came together. So what I learned was, you know, if you're passionate about something and it's something worthwhile telling, you, you, you can get other people enrolled in that. And the other thing I learned uh, that I've always known is, is people trump everything else, regardless of where we filmed or what equipment we had. Without the particular people that I had that, that those two days, we wouldn't have had the film without the people. And I find that very interesting. You say that because, you know, I've come, you know, I do this, you know, interview 
thousands of filmmakers a year and it just everyone talks about equipment 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 you know i got this camera or you know i'm using this editing bay or we're doing 4k or whatever but you know it's really the people at the end of the day that really counts when did you, uh, you know, when, did, when did you learn that well i'm 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 old enough <laughs> that i've gained the wisdom over the years i guess you know with age comes wisdom you know i just what i you know i did a feature film that shot on a standard definition camera but I had one of the great DPs, uh, I think, uh, of the of that of his kind of generation, and he's now directing films for Discovery Channel, like big, you know, ten million dollar Discovery Channel films. So he's super talented. Um, but we shot it on standard definition, and at some screenings, I had people ask me what film stock we shot on. Um, so it definitely wasn't. It had nothing to do with the equipment. It had to do with his skill with lighting uh, and composition. Uh, so that was a, an eye opener for me when people asked me what film stock we shot this standard definition video uh, film on. But um, I also, you know, I work below the line as well. And so I really get to see the value of talented people all across the board. And oftentimes the work they, they do is unsung and they don't get any accolades for it. They know they've done a good job and the people who hired them know they did a good job. But usually when they do a good job, that means the audience doesn't notice it. And so working it below the line a lot has, has also taught me the importance that, you know, any weak link in that chain of talented people and the audience is going to pick up on it. So uh, I was trying to like, you know, I'd rather have my DP in an iPhone than myself with, you know, an Aria Alexa, no question. That is awesome. Thank you, uh, Patrick. And thank you, Tracy, for joining us. Congratulations on both of your films. I wish you nothing but the, but success in this. Thank you.